and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up in this episode, I get my hands on a ZX HD HDMI video for your Spectrum. I play some games and have a blast. I get serious with non-game software. I have a chat to Jeff and I take a peek at my old diaries. Let's get on. Crawl, scan lines, shimmering colours, bleeding. To some, these are perfect, and no emulator can really produce a display like an old CRT television. Some hardened fans insist that the whole experience of playing Spectrum games is enhanced with these cathode ray tube features, and to some extent I would agree. However, I play a lot of games, both on emulation and on TV, and often film these events while doing reviews. Filming CRT televisions can be tricky, as you have to match the shutter speed of a digital camera that technically doesn't have a shutter to the 50 frames per second or 50 hertz of that old TV. Newer LED televisions make life a little easier, but many will not tune into the RF signal of the spectrum. Doing a composite video mod will greatly improve things and works really well on modern televisions, although the picture isn't perfect. But what if you want the best possible picture? Maybe to film things like I do, or just give your eyes less strain. Well, this little box will be our saviour. The ZX HD. And as its name suggests, this wonderful little box will output the spectrum signal in upscaled HDMI. This will, in theory, give you the optimum output. Let's get to the interface first, though. The box contains many things. There are three circuit boards, a HDMI lead, some screws, two parts of a case, and an SD card, and of course the manuals. By itself the interface won't work, the cost of licensing the HDMI format for small numbers of units is obsessive, so Byte Delight came up with an ingenious idea. They used the relatively cheap Raspberry Pi for the HDMI processing, and a custom board for the Spectrum connectivity. This does mean you have to put them together yourself, but it's simple. You connect the three PCBs together, put them in the box, and screw the back on. And that's it, you're done. The unit itself is about the same size as a joystick interface, and will work on all models of UK Spectrums, and some clones as well. When it's all plugged in and the TV springs to life, the picture is, well, to be honest, absolutely brilliant. For comparison, I filmed the composite picture, which up until now I thought was pretty good. I swapped to the HDMI output, and you can see the difference. If you can see any patterning, this is down to the camera and it's not visible in real life. Games look superb. And the unit supports ULA Plus mode too, so you can get extra colours for games that support it. Multicoloured games using engines like Nirvana look brilliant as well, with all the colours being vibrant and sharp. Movement does not show any ghosting, at least to my old eyes, and I did test quite a few games. The unit, though, will not put sound through HDMI, so you have to plug in some speakers, or use the TV's sound input if you've got one. Not really a big deal, but something to be aware of. The ZX HD works with other interfaces too, and I have no trouble plugging it in to my Div MMC Enjoy Pro. You can change the output to suit your needs by editing a file on the SD card. This allows for different resolutions and even stretching the screen to a 16:9 ratio. By default though it runs in auto mode, and I don't think there's any reason to change from that. Another impressive feature is that the unit can pick up interlacing, used in some 128K demos. If this is detected, the ZX HD switches to interlace mode and shows a clear picture. Very clever. I can't really believe how clear the picture is. It's almost like running an emulator on a PC. So if you crave a wonderfully crisp spectrum, then this is the thing to get. Oh dear. If, however, you prefer ghosting, dot crawl and scan lines, taking you back to those CRT days, 
then this probably won't be for you. But I would also suggest visiting an optician. Only joking though, but overall, I really like this device. Now all that we need is for those wonderful people to put the Div MMC Pro and this in the same box. Come on fellas, we're waiting. This is a two-game compilation from Demark, released on the Spectrum in 1991. Both games were released the same year individually, and both games were original arcade titles released in 1990. Let's take Pig Fighter first then. This state-of-the-art arcade beat-em-up used digitised figures instead of the usual sprite-based characters, with each move filmed and placed in the game. This would be a real challenge for the Spectrum, considering the amount of memory available and obviously colour limitations. You can play one of three characters, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, and have to fight your way to the Pit Fighting Championship. You will face seven opponents, and after each win, if you are good enough, there's a grudge match. There are items scattered about that you can pick up and use as well, like crates for example. As with most fighting games, there are numerous controls. Without the fire button pressed, the player can move around, including into and out of the screen. Trying to get into position for an attack though can prove a bit tricky. With the fire button pressed, the player can jump, kick, punch and duck, and perform special moves. The game is multi-load if you've got it on tape so different parts are loaded as you progress. On to the game then. Well, the characters are large, the animation is jerky and the movement is terribly slow. The fighters look poor, chunky and badly shaded. There's really bad colour clash too when a blow is landed, making the screen look a mess. You can just about control the fighter, although some key presses have such a delay that you often think nothing's happening. The jump looks like the player is just moving up the screen, and picking up anything, objects or even the other fighter is hit or miss on whether it can be done or not. There are times when, despite stabbing the keys frantically, your character just stands there doing nothing and then gets smacked in the mouth. Because of the scaling when the fighters move back into the scenery, it can sometimes look like one player is a giant and the other one is a smaller person. And bad collision detection means that if you're at the back of the screen and the computer character is at the front, they can still hit you, which is most unfair. There's a nice little tune playing throughout though, which means there are hardly any sound effects. Despite these flaws and despite the magazines hating it, to be honest I quite enjoyed playing this for a while. I could never manage to get into fighting games, and while playing this I could hardly get the fighter to do what I wanted most of the time, so I guess it's a bad game for that, but somehow I quite liked messing about, landing a few kicks now and again and progressing through to the next level, well as far as I could get anyway. Overall then, it was a brave attempt, but in the end of the day it was a wasted license and a game I would not recommend. <laughs> Super Space Invaders then, and this takes the original well-loved game and adds a load more features, along with upgraded graphics. Sadly, the sound seems to have been left untouched, but who doesn't like that iconic sound anyway? The extra additions include things like backgrounds, some of which are scrolling in later levels, expanding invaders, 
different attack patterns, extra weapons in the form of collections when you shoot the saucer, and cattle mutilation. Yes, you heard that right. On to the Spectrum version then, and the game begins with a monochrome background and masked sprites, and remains in this style throughout, although the background colours do change. When you first start it feels slow and jerky, and gives you a decent version of classic invaders. However, there are no bunkers to hide behind if things get tough, and when you shoot the saucer you do get bonuses. This could be things like freezing the invaders or getting extra weapons. The graphics are tiny, and mix that with the background and sometimes it's hard to see their bombs, and this can be frustrating. Get a decent weapon though, and you can make short work of them. As the levels progress, the invaders do different things. The columns drop down when you hit them, or they expand to take more hits to destroy, and in later levels they start flying around like galaxians. They also change appearance, which adds variety. Sadly there's no boss levels like the arcade, but the action does hot up as you take out each invader. There's also no cattle mutilation levels, at least that I could find on the Spectrum, and even watching the RZX playback I couldn't see them. The thing is though, it mentions this in the manual, and in the Crash Magazine review, so I don't know what's going on there. I suppose it was down to memory restrictions, but that's a great shame as that helped break up the gameplay. The scrolling landscapes are present of course, and despite being an achievement on the Spectrum, with so much going on on screen, it does make locating invaders and their bombs just that little bit harder than it already was. There is one particular level where the background changes to red, and that really hurts my eyes. Sound is used well on the 1 to 8K machines, with varying different effects that all fit in the game nicely. <laughs> Gameplay is good too, and I really enjoyed this. It gives the appeal of the original, with added elements to spice things up a bit. If you like the original, or in fact like shoot 'em ups in general, then certainly give this one a try. Trans Am was released by Ultimate Play the Game in 1983, and was one of the games released on the ROM cartridge for Sinclair's Interface 2. To be honest, I think this was the weakest title of the 416k games put out by Ultimate, but I know a lot of other people like it. The story goes, it's the year 3472, and the Earth is a barren place. A new age arrives, the age of cars and trophies, and there are eight great cups of Ultimate hidden in the wilderness. Collecting all these will give you richness and esteem. However, they're protected by the deadly black turbos. You take control of a super-blown red racer in a quest to locate and collect each of these cups. The game is, as you can see, an overhead racing collecting game. You drive around the map of the US collecting the eight cups, or at least trying to. Chasing you are several other cars, the Deadly Black Turbos, and they will destroy you on contact. With only a limited view, you have to be very careful and react quickly to avoid the crash, and this is linked to how fast you dare go. Going too fast, you risk hitting trees and rocks and other obstacles. Going too slow, and you risk getting caught by the turbos, and that sounds painful. There is also the added risk of an overheating engine. Going too fast for too long will cause it to fail. There are gauges visible on the left of the screen that show various things along with a handy map. Below the map is a proximity meter that will show you the cups as they come into range. 
Not only do you have to put up with obstacles in chasing cars, but you have a fuel limit as well. Luckily though, this can be replenished at various points on the map. As each area is visited, the scenery changes. Sometimes it's a cactus, sometimes rocks. And as with most Ultimate games, the graphics for this and the characters, in this case cars, are excellent. The movement is smooth and the sound is great, especially for a 16K game. Control uses the rotate and move commands, which takes a bit of getting used to, and at first you'll find yourself just running into things because you press the wrong button. Of the four 16K games, this is the only one I've not completed, so I tried really hard to do it. I wanted the full set. Time after time, the other cars just appeared and ran into me. Maybe my reactions were not good, now that I'm a doddering old bloke. And the most I could ever manage was three. You keep wanting to go back though and try again, just get one more cup. So it is addictive, but I still never managed to get more than three. A nice game then, and it beats the majority of 16k releases at the time. But for me, it's not the best 16k ultimate title. It's time to get serious. This is Word Manager, released by OCP Software in 1985. As you may guess, this is a word processor, but it also comes with a free address manager, but we won't be going into that in this episode. Inside the box, there's a large manual with tiny print, along with an OCP Software catalog. Let's have a quick flick through here then. Address manager, finance manager, stock manager, VAT manager. Yes, there's lots of things in here. Oh, and some games as well. The box claims it will work on a number of different printer interfaces, in fact over 15 different types, some of which I have, and for this test I'll be using the Kempston Centronics E interface. Selecting this will run you through various settings for the interface, and this is important, otherwise you'll probably get no carriage returns and everything prints on one line. After this the program loads and the menu options are sparse to say the least. The actual input screen uses 64 characters per line, so it can be difficult to read. The first thing you have to get used to is the controls. The top line of numbers are the controls, so for example 1 inverts the screen and puts it into input mode, 2 turns the caps lock on, etc. If you actually want to type a number on screen, you have to shift it first by pressing the shift key and then the number. A bit confusing really. Also to delete something, you have to move the cursor to before the thing you want to delete and then press the zero key not shifted zero, and this deletes anything to the right of the cursor, which is backwards to what we think of normal today. Moving the cursor around the screen is done with the unshifted arrow keys, and this does take a while to get to grips with. Many times I pressed something by accident, and then could not work out how to get back again. Eventually though, with the help of the manual, I got used to it, and the manual does show you the commands for both the rubber keyed machine and the Spectrum Plus, and I have to say that the manual is excellent. It covers everything in great detail, and I found myself always referring to it. The display, when typing in 64 characters, which gives a good representation of the printout, but as mentioned before, it can be pretty difficult to see, especially on a 14-inch CRT television like we used to have. There are some useful tools in here too, auto-centering of lines using symbol shift G, or you can delete whole lines or whole paragraphs. You can copy whole blocks of text, and that's easy. You just set a start and end marker, and then move the cursor to where you want the text to appear, and copy it or move it. You can also place items from the address manager here too, as mentioned previously. There are other commands to go through, all outlined in the manual, like underline print or bold print. And after about an hour, I did actually find an option to change the direction of the delete. Finally, a delete key that works. So let's see how it prints out. For this demo, I'll be using my trusty Swift 9 dot matrix printer, and as mentioned, the Kempston printer interface, as reviewed in episode 89. To print out, you just go back to the menu using the 3 key, and press the P key, and up pops a menu. Here you can change a few options, like how many copies you want, and here we're printing in draft mode. Obviously, at this stage, you would have configured Word Manager to use your particular interface. You can print in fast or slow mode. Fast will halt all operations while the text is sent to the printer as fast as possible. 
In slow mode this will reduce the print speed, but will let you back into the program to continue editing. The print quality much depends on the printer you are using, obviously, and you can't judge the program because of this. It does though reflect what is on screen. This is NLQ or near letter quality mode on the printer, and as you can see it's much better than draft, but obviously slower. There are worse word processors on the spectrum, take Quicksilver's word processor for example, but then again there are much better ones, the Taskword series springs to mind. For a middle of the road package then, and once you get used to the key commands, it's not a bad little thing at all, especially for the original asking price of just $12.95. And this does score extra points for being fully Mac Drive and Opus Discovery compatible. There have been many attempts to get Super Mario Bros, the famous Nintendo game, across to the spectrum. Some were terrible and a lot of companies shied away from even attempting this because of legal problems. The nearest we probably got was Great Guyana Sisters, or Great Gianna Sisters, or whatever way you want to pronounce it, and that game got pulled for those very reasons. This though is not a commercial product, and yes I know that doesn't stop Nintendo issuing copyright infringement notices, but at least it's out there for the time being. This is a three world demo for 128k machines, written by Sergei Smirnov, and it's very impressive. Make sure you turn on Giga Screen Flicker Reduction in your emulator if you have it, otherwise your eyes will pop out. Now I don't claim to be a Super Mario Bros expert, so I couldn't tell you if there's anything missing or anything extra, apart from the obvious missing coloured backgrounds and coloured sprites but I can say that this is a fine attempt to bring smooth scrolling platformers to the machine. The music is excellent and really helps the game along, and the gameplay is good and challenging. You have to master the high jump manoeuvre to get anywhere in this game though, and to do this you hold down the fire whilst running and jumping at the same time, and this will allow you to jump to higher levels. Although this is just a three world demo, it's certainly worth grabbing if it's still available. A great little demo then, that promises a lot more to come. So we're going to talk about favourite cassette covers. Yes, this was a Patreon request, amongst others. Uh, we might get onto others if we sort of drift about, but... Favourite cassette covers? Yes, I'm a very big fan of the early 80s covers. Mentioned it before, but I'm trying to think of one that, that stands out. I mean, the ultimate ones are obvious ones, aren't they? Attic Attack was brilliant. Attic Attack, I think the artwork on that is superb. And don't, it, didn't you like Underworld, even though the game was not so good? I like, yeah, I like I like the poster for Underworld. I like the ad, but I think, right. I think the poster is superb. I like anything that Wakelin did. He did uh, Hunchback and Moon Alert and Eskimo Eddie and Pogo. But m a lot of the Ocean stuff he did, and a lot of the Ocean stuff is excellent. Did he do Daily Thompson's Decathlon? I think he did, yes. Is he the gentleman that's recently deceased? Yes, it, sadly it was. Um, I did meet him at, I think it was Play Blackpool a, two years ago, and he was, he was selling his large prints that signed, and I nearly bought the one that he did for... Mr. Wimpy, which was uh, which was then changed for another one, which was nowhere near as good, and I should have bought that because I, I I really liked the the original one that he did. I I just think Dilly Thompson's Decathlon was superb. When I was doing my top ten loading screens, that was um, one. There's uh, some of the soft tech games are good. I like Star Blitz, which mm. is a quite a nice one, and I also like some of the Silver Soft early titles like um, Orbiter. I think Orbiter the art advert for Orbiter is really, really good. Yeah. The the ones I really liked, and I don't know if this counts as cassette cover, is the Beyond. Oh, yes, the stuff like uh, Lords of Midnight Lords and Cytron. And... Doomstalk's Revenge, they're both superb. 
mm. really, really good and really kind of they were really immersive. I mean, some uh, of, some of the early stuff was hand drawn and terrible. It was. There were some bad ones. Some of the later games, when the boxes got big and it got a bit more prof- professional, were quite good. Yeah. What did What did we think of the Horus ones? I hate the Horus games. <laughs> I hate the games, and and I don't like the covers, and I don't like anything about them. I don't I don't see the appeal of Horus, to be honest. I tell you what was good. Back to school and school days. I thought you were going to say Jet Set Willy then. No. Back to school and school days. <laughs> I did like the Manic Miner ones. There were three Manic Miner ones. I didn't like the later Software Projects one with the telephone. I preferred the orig- one of the originals. The, the Bug Bite ones. Yeah. And actually, some of the Bug Bite titles, the early titles, are quite good. Yeah. Slightly agnostic. Some of the Level 9 ones were good, weren't they? The, um, they were really good. There, they were quite intricate, those. Yeah, some of the adventure ones were good. The Hobbit was just the cover of the book, wasn't it? So yeah, yeah. It doesn't really count. To be honest with you, some of the Mastertronic ones weren't bad. BMX races, I remember being quite good. That that made it look like a really exciting game, um, and the game wasn't bad. The Finders Keepers one, I remember buying Finders Keepers and getting it home, really enjoying it. And I played it for hours. For a budget game, it wasn't too bad. When you think Master Trinic were budget games, they were cheap. The covers didn't look that cheap. But there yeah, have it's... been there have been some d- disappointing inlays. Death Chase, 3D Death Chase. The game was excellent, but the cover was. I, I don't think I liked it. It was a, a motorbike in a sort of weird, sort of cyber forest thing. It didn't. I don't know. It, it didn't portray the game fully. I don't think. Was it the same as the loading screen? I can't remember. The no, cover. the loading screen had a motorbike on it, from like a Honda or something like that. Whereas the the advert and the cassette had like a weird hover bike thing with wings on the back. All right, that's nothing like the game, is it? Ah, hold on. What about the Monty Mole games? They weren't bad. Mm, uh, not so sure. I think they were, I don't know, I think they were mediocre, to be honest. Yeah, it had the mole on the front and a mine shaft. Mm, that not too know. bad. Android 1 and 2, Android 2 was good. Yeah, Android 2 was good. Uh, Quicksilver Battlezone cover was really good, and and in fact most of the early Quicksilver titles as well were really good. I like Dragon's Bane, I thought that was excellent. Space Intruders was excellent cover, so was Meteor Storm. There was some really good stuff on that. And Frenzy. Uh, um, I, can't, I can't think of any more good ones. If anybody's got any favourites that we've forgotten, then put them in the comments. Yeah, please do. This section follows on from the Christmas special and pulls out items from my diaries So let's canter through February. The earliest entry I could find this month is from the 12th of February 1984. And here I'm just testing out some routines to collect and drop items in an adventure game I was writing. Moving swiftly on then to the 11th of February 1985, and it was raining. After a cup of tea, I typed out a routine from Popular Computing Weekly that allowed me to print out in-game screenshots. I tested this on several games, but it didn't work, and finally I got it working with Jetpack, and here's a printout to prove it. Leaping ahead again to the 22nd of February 1987, and a visit to my friend's house for some homebrew and Spectrum shenanigans. I wrote an adventure based on the old Peter Cook and Dudley Moore characters Derek and Clive, and we played through this a few times whilst drunk. The images are blurred out because my friend isn't anymore, and he may object anyway to his image being online. Well, that was a short walkthrough. Maybe more next time, if it pleases you. (laughs) 